Welcome to the Cathedral of the Incarnation in the Diocese of Maryland for this first ordination in over two years where we have not all had to be masked and socially distanced. Our service begins on page four. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Have they been selected in accordance with the canons of this church? And do you believe their manner of life to be suitable to the exercise of this ministry? We certify to you that they have satisfied the requirements of the canons, and we believe them qualified to ordain the order. Jennifer and Karen, will you be loyal to the doctrine, discipline, and worship of Christ as this church has received them? And will you, in accordance with the canons of this church, obey your bishop and other ministers who may have authority over you and your work? I am willing and ready to do so. And I solemnly declare that I do believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God and to contain all things necessary to salvation. And I do solemnly engage to conform to the doctrine, discipline, and worship of the Episcopal Church. Please sign the certificate. The correct certificate. <laughs> Dear friends in Christ, you know the importance of this ministry and the weight of your responsibility in presenting Jennifer and Karen for ordination to the sacred order of deacons. Therefore, if any of you know any impediment or crime because of which we should not proceed, come forward now and make it known. Is it your will that Jennifer and Karen be ordained as deacons? It is. Will you uphold them in this ministry? We will. In peace, let us pray to the Lord.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God of unchangeable power and eternal life, look favorably upon your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things that were being cast down are being raised up, and things that had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by whom, through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Ecclesiasticus. He seeks out the wisdom of all the ancients and is concerned with prophecies. He preserves the sayings of the famous and penetrates the subtleties of parables. He seeks out the hidden meanings of proverbs and is at home with the obscurities of the parables. He serves among the great and appears before rulers. He travels in foreign lands and learns what is good and evil in the human lot. He sets his heart on rising early to seek the Lord who made him and to petition the Most High. He opens his mouth in prayer and asks pardon for his sins. If the great Lord is willing, he will be filled with the spirit of understanding. He will pour forth words of wisdom of his own and give thanks to the Lord in prayer. The Lord will direct his counsel and knowledge as he meditates on his mysteries. He will show the wisdom of what he has learned and will glory in the law of the Lord's covenant. The word of the Lord. This morning's psalm is Psalm 119, and we'll pray it responsively by whole verse. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Make me go in the path of your commandments, for that is my desire. Turn my eyes from watching what is worthless. Give me life in your ways. Turn away from the reproach which I dread, because your judgments are good. A reading from the Acts of the Apostle. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on table. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer 
and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and many of the priests became obedient to the faith. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. A dispute arose among the disciples as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. The Gospel of the Lord.
have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do what, with it what you will. Give me only your love and grace. That is enough for me. Amen. And please be seated. Now, Karen and Jennifer, you know this. I am going to actually ask you to stand up. To stand up as I begin my service. And I want the two of you to turn around and to face the congregation. Look out among those who are here today who just committed themselves to uphold you in ministry with a resounding we will. This is your community. And some are watching on video and others are certainly here in spirit. Some of them have known you your whole life. Others just for a short while. But they have walked with you. They have loved you. They have coached you. They have laughed and held and stood with you through the ups and downs, the twists and turns of your journey. And they will, they will continue beyond this glorious day. And now I want you to cast your eyes beyond this community this community of love to the doors at the back of this sacred space. These are the doors that you are being called to pass through, to go out and to joyfully proclaim the gospel of the people, a people that desperately need to know to the depths of their brokenness that they are loved. This, that, is the threshold of your ministry. You will, not, you will serve not as one higher or greater, but as their servant, ready to offer your love through words or actions or just mere presence. And now lastly, I would like you to turn around and face east and gaze upon the Lord's table that you will be setting in a short while. Christ's table where you will lay the needs and the concerns and the hopes of the world right there that you are serving. The table where everyone will receive the grace and the strength and the love needed to go back out into the world to face the challenges before them. Take in all these images because these are the images that will serve as the cornerstone of your ministry. Always remember where it began, here with all these people and that door that will take you out into the world and the Lord's table that will feed you and those you serve. Hold this moment so deep and within your soul. Just hold it. Just hold it. And now you may sit down and relax. As we turn to the scripture that you sh chose for your diaconal ordination. Now I have to say all the scriptures you chose they're all rich with symbolism and guidance for the occasion. But I want to focus on Luke's message because I believe it represents the most challenging part of being a person of faith within the world today. Now prior to this reading, Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time where the Jewish people were gathered for the Passover. Authorities were conspiring to kill him, and one of the twelve, Judas Iscariot, has agreed to betray him. Jesus directed some of his friends to prepare for the Passover meal that he would share with the inner circle, his inner circle, the disciples. 
As they reclined around the table, Jesus shared in the bread and the wine with the words that reflect his real and spiritual presence and the promise of eternal life. And then he says, but see, the one who betrays me is with me and his hand is on the table. Now this is where we come in or today's scripture begins as the disciples hear this word betrayal, an argument broke out and they jockey for position of being the greatest and therefore not Jesus's betrayer. We should not miss the irony of this conversation. Jesus has spoken words of great seriousness. He was about to go to the cross and sacrifice him for all himself for all of us and his closest friends argued about who was the greatest and this wasn't the first time their argument wasn't about their concern for Jesus and the one who was to be betrayed but about themselves and their self-preservation clearly if they were deemed the greatest they would be absolved of any finger pointing or accusations from others. But Jesus isn't drawn into their petty argument. Instead, he turned their argument into a teaching moment, as he had done time and time before, and I dare say, a teaching moment for us as well. Jesus began to remind them that the social and the political structures of their time did not reflect God's kingdom, the kingdom that he wanted them to spread throughout the lands, a kingdom that reflected God's dream for all humanity, a world that led first and foremost with the heart of love and mercy not with the ego of power and greed. These were the disciples who had traveled with Jesus for most of his ministry. Surely they thought of themselves as their part of the inner circle, and they were. But being a part of the inner circle didn't mean that they were placed above others. In fact, it meant that they were to be and to act and to embody one who was often seen as the lowest, or as Jesus said, the youngest. Even though Jesus had modeled his behavior of servanthood time and time again, when he ate with tax collectors, touched and healed the sick, befriended the marginalized, they still focused on themselves and their personal needs. Some habits, were hard to break. The world he was describing was a world where rank and birthright didn't matter. Unlike the kings of the Gentiles who lorded over them, it didn't matter if they were a religious leader or a leper. Jesus' ministry viewed a world that reflected inclusion, not exclusion. He was calling them to live into a new way of being that was so counter to the world of yesterday and the world today. Jesus's conversation with his disciples was setting the stage for their future ministry. In a few minutes, you will take the ordination vows of a deacon. And just as D Jesus introduced to his disciples the realities of God's kingdom versus the world they lived in, these vows do the same. They are clear and reflect the same social order that Jesus was challenging his disciples to live into. In fact, you are being called, and I quote, to a special ministry of servanthood directly under your bishop to serve all people, particularly the poor and the weak and the sick and the lonely. Now, as you sit on this glorious day with a full heart, no doubt, surrounded by family and friends, 
It is easy, my friends, to nod your head in agreement to living a life of servanthood. But quite honestly, it is often hard and lonely. It is much more than just being kind to others. It requires a constant reorienting towards Jesus, returning again and again so that your heart and your mind are aligned solely with God. It is about giving up the power and the authority that will be given to you merely because you wear a collar around your neck and the title, The Reverend, before your name. It is about walking humbly beside God and those you serve. It is so important that your ministry begins with the strong foundation of servanthood or servant leadership. Living into this role is where the true work begins. It is where you and others are transformed by mere simple acts of love and care and presence. It is a ministry that will stretch you beyond your comfort zone and the boundaries you have built around you. It can't be done without the other vows that you will take, a consistent and a strong prayer life, continued study of the scriptures, self-care and love for yourself and your family, and I would add a lot of humor. You are to build the bridges that divide us from them so all of God's kingdom can be joined together, not separated from one another. It is a life that is honorable, but will not bring your, you wealth or recognition. Instead, it will bring you closer to living the life that Jesus laid out for his disciples and us today. I want to share with you a true story that I believe reflects how we often think we are on the right path until we aren't. Now Susan's entire professional career was that of a nurse. A woman of faith, her profession just personified who she was. That was why she was so proud and excited to take the position as the head of nursing at the hospital where she had been serving for many years. She knew she was perfect for this position. She knew her field well. They respected her in the medical community. Her position reflected the culmination of all her work. That was until the nurses union decided to strike. And she, along with the other administrators, were called in to fill the void. As she recounted her experience, she said tensions were so high. Her days were filled with caring for very anxious patients, concerned family members, filling out paperwork, etc., etc. And when one job was finished, there was another one that waited for her. Now, after one exceptionally long day, she found herself at the end of a corridor and there was a dark, empty room. She slipped in, hoping just to catch a few moments of peace and quiet. Every muscle ached in her body. She sat in peace for a few minutes and began to relax until the telephone rang. She knew she could ignore it, let them leave a message, or call someone else, she thought. But her caring instincts took over, and she picked it up. And she was asked to visit a patient whose request for care had gone unanswered all day. Everyone had been too busy, and would she please go and see what the patient needed? When she walked into the room, she saw an elderly gentleman sitting in a wheelchair. He looked up at her and almost embarrassed, said that his feet and his toenails needed care. He couldn't reach his feet himself. Would she be willing to help? 
As she wheeled him into the shower, turned on the warm water and bent down to tend to his feet, she said she got angrier and angrier, angry at the administration and the nurses, the needy patients and their families and this man. Why me, God? What did I do? What did I do to deserve this? I'm the head of nursing. Then she felt a tap on her shoulder and she stopped what she was doing and looked up at him. She said as she gazed into his eyes brimming with tears, she heard him say, thank you, thank you. Suddenly her world shifted. Her heart that had been encrusted with anger and a bit of self-pity melted away. And she realized that she was looking into the eyes of Jesus. And she was right where she needed to be. Jennifer, Karen, there will be moments in your ministry that will test you in ways you never imagined. But you both are ready. May you never forget the cornerstone of your ministry. And when you look into the eyes of the other, May you always see the eyes of Jesus who walks beside you every moment of your life. God bless you and thank you. Beloved children of God, every Christian is called to follow Jesus Christ, serving God through the power of the Holy Spirit. God now calls you to a special ministry of servanthood directly under your bishop. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are to serve all people, particularly the poor, the weak, the sick, and the needy. As a deacon in the church, you are to study the Holy Scriptures, to seek nourishment from them, and to model your life upon them. You are to make Christ and his redemptive love known by your word and example to those among whom you live and work and worship. You are to interpret to the church the needs, concerns, and hopes of the world. You are to assist the bishop and priests in public worship and the ministration of God's word and sacraments. And you are to carry out other duties assigned to you from time to time. At all times, your life and teaching are to show forth Christ's people that in serving and helping, they are serving Christ himself. My friends, do you believe that you are truly called by God and the church to this life and work of a deacon? I believe, I believe I am so called. Do you now, in the presence of the church, commit yourself to this trust and responsibility? I do. I do. Will you be guided by the pastoral direction and leadership of your bishop? I will. I will. will you be faithful in prayer? and in the reading and study of Holy Scriptures. I will. Will you look for Christ in all others? 
being ready to help and serve those in need. I will. Will you do your best to pattern your life and that of your family in accordance with the teachings of Christ so that you may be a wholesome example to all people? I will. Will you in all these things seek not your glory, but the glory of the Lord Christ? I will. May the grace of God uphold you in the service that has been laid upon you. Amen. Amen. God, creator of all, we praise you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, who took on himself the form of a servant and humbled himself, becoming obedient even to death on the cross. We praise you that you have highly exalted him and made him Lord of all, and that through him we know that whoever would be great must be servant of all. We praise you for your many ministries to your church and for calling these your servants to the order of deacon. Therefore, Father, through Jesus Christ, your son, give your Holy Spirit to Jennifer. Fill her with grace and power and make her a deacon in your church. Make her, O Lord, modest and humble, strong and constant, to observe the discipline of Christ. Let her life and teaching so reflect your commandments that through her many may come to know you and love you. As your son came not to be served but to serve, May this deacon share in Christ's service and come to the unfaithful glory of him who with you and the Holy Ghost lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, give your Holy Spirit to Karen. Fill her with grace and power and make her a deacon in your church. Make her, O Lord, modest and humble, 
strong and constant, to observe the discipline of Christ. Let her life and teaching so reflect your commandments that through her many may come to know you and love you. As your son came not to be served, but to serve, made this deacon share in Christ's service and come to the unending glory of him who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, Carol. The congregation may be seated. I think you will be able to see the vesting of our two new deacons. I mean, first, uh, Jennifer's down. Jennifer, receive this Bible as a sign of, the author of your authority to proclaim God's word and to assist in the ministrations of the holy sacraments. Amen. And before I give the Bible to Karen, there is a cross, a pectoral cross, that I'm going to bless. Bless, O oh Lord, this cross that Charles, who gives it, and Karen, who wears it, may abide in your favor and continue in your peace. May the cross remind them of your love for the world, and may it remind Karen of her duty to proclaim the cross as the way of life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Karen, receive this Bible as a sign of, the, of your authority to proclaim God's word and to assist in the ministration of the holy sacraments. And now without restraint, I invite you as you are able to stand and to welcome the newest deacons in the Anglican Communion. You can, you can move into the center with your families. The peace, peace of, of the Lord, Lord be always with you. you. You may be seated. Welcome everyone, I'm Rob Bolter. I'm the Dean of this Cathedral Church of the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this wonderful service of ordination. And, and as Bishop Eloff said, it's a chance for us to gather again and to sing together. And, and many of us without masks, and we're, we're grateful that things are starting to change with the pandemic and that we can do this again. It's a great blessing that you're all here. So a few things that you'll need to know about communion. Uh, Holy Communion will be in bread only today as we're still continuing to observe some COVID precautions. But our two newest deacons, Jennifer and Karen, will be our communion ministers. They'll be on the floor here. The ushers will guide you forward and go to whomever you wish for the Holy Communion today. And then also I want you to know that right after the service, there'll be a photo opportunity with the bishop and the ordinance to, uh, to take photographs here. And please take these photographs and share them wide, widely. 
Uh, put them out there on social media. Let people know what's going on in our church because it's a wonderful day for the church. Now we're going to take up an offering to help support the work of, of, of putting these ordinations together. Let us with gladness make an offering of our life and labor to the Lord. It's in the bulletin, but please know, if you're a visitor, that all persons who desire to receive the body and blood of Christ are welcome to do so in the church. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant, from before time you made all things ready for creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, wind, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways, but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing.
glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace, you looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw the whole world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread and gave it to them and broke it. He gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper was ended, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God, of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts. They may, they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your Spirit over the whole earth and make us a new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language, people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundations of the world through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, the kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who sin against us. Saving us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ, who are many, are one body, and we all share in one kind of bread. The gifts of God for the people of God, all are welcome at the Lord's table. The body of Christ, keep you in everlasting life.
Let us pray and say together, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the holy food and blood of your Son and for uniting us through him in the fellowship of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for raising up among us faithful servants for the ministry of your word and sacraments. We pray that Jennifer and Karen may be to us effective examples in word and action, in love and patience, and in holiness of life. Grant that we with them may serve you now and always rejoice in your glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Minister to the afflicted. Preach the good news to the poor in action as well as word. And go forth as servants of your Lord Jesus Christ to serve the world in his name. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.
forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit.